struggle and crisis in the world and in the church. An ex-priest, Martin Luther, has caused many innocent lambs not aware of his disobedience and betrayal to the church to stray. As always, when the church is under attack and things look hopeless, God raises up a powerful saint to save his church. St. Mary Magdalene de Pazzi was one of those saints. She was born in Florence, Italy, into a very prominent and most influential family. Both sides of her parents' families were close friends of the ruling Medici family. They would be responsible for contributing down through the history of Florence many highly acclaimed statesmen, but none whose mark would be so profoundly and everlastingly felt on the church and the world as a Carmelite nun from their ranks who would far surpass their fleeting fame. She was baptized Catherine after St. Catherine of Siena. Even as a young child, Catherine had a deep awareness of the real presence of Jesus in the Eucharist. When her mother received communion, Catherine could not be dissuaded to leave her side, insisting she wanted to be near Jesus, whose presence she so strongly felt in her mother. She would ask her mother over and over again about the three persons and one God. She later wrote, the word gives nothing less than love. The Father never ceases to instill it and the Holy Ghost to delight in it. And from this giving of the word, the soul becomes rich. From the instilling of the Father, the soul becomes a lake of love. And from the delight of the Holy Ghost, the soul becomes treasurer of the most holy trinity. From an early age, she showed an affinity towards the religious life. One time at home, the family was searching for her. They found her praying, and this is what she was saying. O oh, my bridegroom, thou art to us father, thou bridegroom, lord and brother. But I do not wish to stop at this word, father. I wish to go beyond. I wish to call thee bridegroom, consider thee a bridegroom, embrace thee, hold thee, love thee as thou art my chaste, pure, sweet, and loving bridegroom, knowing that without, without thee I cannot live, neither can I be content. When her father was appointed governor of Cortona, Catherine was placed in a convent school there and learned to love the faithful and holy life she saw so authentically lived out each day. When she made her decision to enter the Carmelite order, at first the family objected. They had plans to marry her off to another leading family of Florence. But when they saw that none of the suitors who asked for her hand in marriage could dissuade her from her intended plans to become a bride of Christ, Catherine was finally allowed to enter the convent of St. Mary on the Feast of the Assumption. This chapel is a very important place in the life of St. Mary Magdalene de Passy in that this is where she was received into the community. On January 30th, 1583, she received her habit uh, and she dropped her name Catherine, took on the name Mary Magdalene. And from that time on, she espoused uh, the, uh, the virtues of Mary Magdalene and considered herself a sinner one of the worst sinners as Mary Magdalene had been. In this room, she had all, probably all of her ecstasies, or at least most of her ecstasies took place here in this room. When she received her habit, the priest placed a crucifix in her hands and said the words, God forbid that I should glory, save in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. As he pronounced these words, her face became radiant, and yet she was in tremendous pain. And one of the nuns afterwards said, well, why, why were you in so much pain? How could you bear that pain? And she pointed to this crucifix right here. And she said, see what the infinite love of God suffered for my salvation. That same love sees my weakness and gives me courage. Those who call to mind the sufferings of Christ and who offer up their own to God through his passion find their pains sweet and pleasant. Have you ever done that? Have you ever noticed that when you offer your pain for the poor souls in purgatory, or you offer it 
uh, saying, oh Lord, if only this can be used to take away some of the pain that you suffered on the way to the cross and on the cross. Do you notice how the pain becomes less unexplainable, but it does. Or when you suffer redemptive suffering for somebody, the Lord takes it away from you more times than not. I'd like to tell you, Bob was saying that um, many of her ecstasies uh, were here in the church. Well, it stands to reason, doesn't it? Ecstasies are primarily a time of intimate communion with our Lord Jesus, with the Blessed Mother, who was at the foot of the cross and never leaves her son, and with the saints, with the angels. The angels were also with Jesus on the cross. So Mary Magdalene had this tremendous intimacy with Jesus on the cross. This would be a natural place. One night Jesus appeared to Mary Magdalene. He said to her, My bride, tonight I wish to be with thee, and I shall give thee rest in me again. And she wrote, and I, hearing this, felt myself filled with pain. I would fain have asked all creatures to pray God for me. And I remained in this inner and outer pain until three o'clock in the morning. Then I saw that Jesus gave me his blessed wounds, and at once every pain and sorrow left me. Mary Magdalene was praying to Jesus one day and said, O oh Lord, why dost thou so unite thyself to me, to sanctify me, to exalt me, to become capable of what by myself and in myself I am not capable? And in that moment she saw St. Augustine write in her heart these words, Verbum, in letters of gold, and Caro Factum Est, in letters of blood. The Word became flesh. Jesus appeared to Mary Magdalene de Pazzi. He was beautiful. His hands were covered with rings, and stretching out her hand, she offered her ring finger so gracefully and said to him, Catherine and Augustine will hold my hand, but let me touch the Word. Thou hast said that thou dost not hold our desires in contempt. Grant me mine now. Let me have a memory, a mind, a will, desire, affection, intention, everything abandon in thee the word. And with that, Jesus slipped the ring on her finger and Mary Magdalene was mystically married to her Lord Jesus. On this one particular day, Mary Magdalene was here in the church praying. She went into ecstasy. And who came into the church, into the chapel, but a sister who had passed on recently. She came in, and she went and knelt before the Blessed Sacrament. And she just sat, just knelt and knelt. And she said to, to Mary Magdalene, Mary Magdalene said, how come that you are still in purgatory? Because this sister was known for her piety, for her holiness. She said, well, when I was alive, I grudgingly came and spent time with our Lord Jesus in the Blessed Sacrament. Oh, I did all other things. I lived the rule. I um, was faithful to my duties. But when I had to spend time, I had to spend time. And she, she did spend the time. She came here and she spent the time. But the words were when I had to, when I was obligated to, instead of rejoicing at that time, feeling it's a privilege to be with her Lord and Savior. And she said, worse than all the physical suffering that I am enduring in purgatory is the absence of the beatific vision of my God, my spouse. I had been waiting for that time, and I cannot see him. So here, by his mercy, he has allowed me to come and be close, as close as I can to him without seeing him in his beatific vision. And so she, she knelt there, adoring our Lord Jesus in the Blessed Sacrament. When the hour was over, remember Jesus said, can you not spend one hour with me? 
When her hour of adoration was over, St. Mary Magdalene saw her rise and her spirit ascend into heaven. One hour before the Blessed Sacrament. Do you grudgingly spend an hour with our Lord before the Blessed Sacrament? Do you spend an hour? Do you even have five minutes for him after Mass, before Mass, during the week, on the way to work? Do you? This was a lady whom the Lord gave tremendous highs, spiritual highs and tremendous lows. She experienced the greatest ecstasies, but also the deepest <clears throat> spiritual dryness. There was a time in her life where she could not feel the Lord's presence at all. She was always going through <clears throat> temptations of one kind. She, she fought the battle of the food. She fought the battle of fasting. Fasting was not an easy thing for her. She was starving constantly. One day, while she could not rest, having received from God the knowledge of purity, this blessed soul from Christmas Day was greatly afflicted, depressed, and troubled on account of the strong temptation she suffered, especially that against purity, so that she incessantly begged the Most Holy Virgin to grant her the grace of delivery from this strong temptation. And on the 17th of September, the day of St. Francis Stigmata, as she was full of this desire, the Most Holy Mother appeared to her and showed her she had not offended God, but on the contrary had with great fortitude overcome this temptation, and she covered her with a pure white veil. From our dear Lord Jesus, she received special gifts, namely his loving heart, the ring, the crown of thorns, the holy stigmata, and the gift of purity. And so by the Lord's will, she also received temptations to offset these gifts. Troubled within, by the temptation to renounce the veil and her vocation, at last, after passing the whole day in this great conflict, to confound and to overcome the devil, she took the keys of the convent door and placed them in the hands of the crucified Lord so that the devil could see she was here to stay. At the, the last real suffering that she had lasted five years, and that's what Bob was talking about. And that was when she felt nothing. She didn't feel Jesus, not in the Eucharist, in no way. She felt so alone, so forsaken, like our dear Lord on the cross. She would cry out, don't you love me anymore? How can you withhold yourself from me? And this lasted five long years. She had a time of darkness where uh, she considered, she judged herself the worst of sinners, hopeless, helpless, and she couldn't feel her Lord. Do you know what she did? She didn't leave the church. She didn't leave the Lord. She didn't stop trying. Each day, each moment of the day, she gave him 100%, even though she felt nothing in return. And finally, one day, it was over. And they heard her exclaim, Rejoice with me, for my winter is at an end. Help me, she turned to her prioress and said, Help me to thank and glorify my Creator. The winter had ended and her springtime had begun. From that time on, our Lord having tested her for five years, her ecstasies increased. All right, picture we're outside. This is not inside. This is the Campanile, the bell tower. And St. Mary Magdalene de Pazzi would stand here. The bell would be here. And she'd start ringing that bell. And she'd ring the bell. What would she say? She me? was in ecstasy. And she would go into ecstasy, come up here, and she'd be ringing the bell and wake everyone up in Florence. And she'd be calling out, come and love the Lord. 
love the Lord, love the Lord. Imagine everybody waking up with her sounding that bell. Oh, how I wish today that we could just get there and sound all the bells of all the churches crying out, come and worship the Lord. She had so many heavenly gifts. She prophesied. She told, the po she told Alexander de Medici, you remember, she was of the Medici family. She told Alessandro de Medici that he would become Pope, but he would have a very short term. It lasted 26 days. She was able to read men's hearts. That was very difficult for her. Imagine the pain of reading a sinner's heart. She had the gift of bilocation, being in two places at one time. Um, and she became an instrument of healing and bringing about conversions. Amazing, a cloistered nun not going out into the world, right here. With the gift of healing and Amazing. prophecy. People would come to her for counseling through the grill. It's one of these, you know, you think they, at one time, once they come inside the convent and they don't go out anymore, that their life with the outside world is over. That's never the case. Our Lord sends people to them. In the case of Mary Magdalene de Pazzi, the Lord sent many, many famous well-known people to her for counseling. Do you remember what happened when she would go into ecstasy, what the nuns would see? There were times uh, she would get so stiff, her body would become so stiff, it seemed that rigor mortis had set in, and her body would become so heavy, they couldn't even move her. They thought she had died. And then other times, they didn't even know she was in ecstasy, she would be going around doing all her duties. Meanwhile, she is communicating with Jesus and sometimes suffering the passion, but no one knew it, just went about her, her duties. Holy Thursday, Jesus, her bridegroom, appeared to her, to her soul. He was covered, his, he was bleeding, his skin was hanging. He could barely walk. He had a cape on his shoulders and his head was pierced with thorns, blood running down his face. She cried out, why can it not be I who suffer all those insults, mockery, and scorn? With that, her arms opened. She received the bundle of rods that had struck him. The nuns could see, they looked at her, and it was obvious by looking at her face that she was in the garden of Gethsemane. And then she was at the foot of the cross. If you could have only seen the horror in her eyes, it makes us pause to think, was she at the foot of the cross? Was she there when they drove those nails into our Lord's body? And his body just jumped up in pain. Was she there? Is that what she saw? Was she there when Jesus was struggling for, for breath? Was she there when he said his seven last words of compassion and love for us? Was she there when he died on the cross? This is what they, they could see, an indescribable sorrow and agony in her face. And if you look over here, you'll see the sign of the cross. So her whole life was, was by way of the cross, everything she did. Like Teresa of Avila, another Carmelite, reformer of the Carmelites. Mary Magdalene served the Lord the way Teresa of Avila did. In the kitchen, in the laundry room, in the everyday living out the life the way we're called to do, where we are, where God has planted us, all we have to do is do the will of the Father. Washing clothes? Fine. Drawing water? Fine. Praying? Fine. The will of the Father. What a privilege to be here. What a privilege. Okay. 
that standing in the room where St. Mary Magdalene de Pazzi lived and died, uh, it was towards the end of her life, our Lord Jesus did not give her the gift he had given many other saints, the gift of suffering, but he allowed her to die quickly uh, with not much pain. However, as she was dying and the sisters were sing, singing, holy, 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 our Lord allowed her to see her glorified body, her own glorified body. Not a spiritual body, but a physical body she was allowed to see. She was adorned with the finest gowns. She had on beautiful rings and a marvelous crown filled with rubies and diamonds. And our Lord said to her, as you have lived mm. such a humble, obedient, virtuous life now and always so seeking humility. This was a very big virtue of ours. He said, since you sought humility in your lifetime, let you now, I say, be exalted, my daughter. And she was. And she was covered with a great light as, as her soul left her body. This was a very special saint. You know, this uh, saint did not suffer at the end, but her life was one of passion of sharing the passion of our Lord Jesus. And let us make something very clear. These saints who shared in the passion of Jesus did not seek suffering. They sought only to share in our Lord's suffering. And when she shared in it, she did it for first the poor souls in purgatory, especially those for whom no one prayed, and for the conversion of sinners. Her heart broke when she, when she thought about sinners. Um, she prayed for the stony hearts of heretics and prayed for them because they had lost their way. She prayed for the conversion of those who had lost their faith and gone away into cults. Especially, you have to remember, she is of that period, that horrible period, when so many poor souls were being led astray, away, helplessly from the Roman Catholic Church. She wrote, O oh Lord, you destroy and consume me. You make me die, and yet I live. O oh Lord, it is a great suffering you make me feel, so great that even my body, too, shares in it. O souls, come to the Lord, that love which so loves you, come to love. As one of our sisters said today, the way to Easter Sunday was through Good Friday. And so these saints understood it because our Lord was in communication, intimate communication with them. So they knew the way to the salvation, the redemption, of the souls of the world. And it was through the cross, sharing in the passion. And so today, when people are uh, seeking the easy way out, or we're trying to be sold the easy way out, oh, please listen to the messages of the, that come to us from the poor souls in purgatory. Please listen and let this be a stamp on your heart. Her words are as true today as the day she spoke them. They do not know thee, Lord, and do not wish to know thee, but in every way they will come to know thee. O Lord, I die a living death. O suffering, thou art glorious and sorrowful, suffering which gives me joy, and joy which gives me sorrow. Well, family, we're here at the final resting place of St. Mary Magdalene de Pazzi in a, a small town outside of Florence called Careggi, up on a hill, in a cloistered Carmelite monastery. After the saint uh, died, uh, her body was brought here uh, to her final resting place. Her body is incorrupt. It has never decomposed. And this is what brought us here some 19 years ago because we wanted to, to visit the, uh, to venerate the body of a, an incorrupt saint. Little did we know all that there is about St. Mary Magdalene de Pazzi, 
Well, the Lord has given us this gift of being able to research and write and share with you uh, not only the life of this powerful saint, but also the, the, the ways that she was able to help the poor souls in purgatory. You know, um, there's a joy today for us in meeting these Carmelites, cloistered Carmelites, living the rule of Saint Teresa la Grande. But there's also was a sadness as we spoke to Mother Superior and one of the other sisters. Mother Superior asked me, she said, why? Why do we not have more vocations? And she was very sad. She said, if what, the way you say our life is such a powerful role model, our saint is such a powerful role model in the world today, why do we not have more vocations? Mm. And our only response was, because you cannot want to be something you're not familiar with. They don't know. No one's been telling your children the stories of the saints, of these great saints, these women and men who gave up their lives because they were so in love with our Lord Jesus. But I said to our beautiful sisters, be not afraid. We pray that you have benefited from our sharing with you the life of St. Mary Magdalene de Pazzi as much as we have in researching it and bringing it to you. There's a reason why all of this comes to you, is a reason why the Lord allows us to bring it to you. He wants so much for you to benefit from this, to learn from the saints, to offer them and ask for their uh, intercession. We love you. We thank you for being with us. God bless you. Pray for the poor souls in purgatory and then in heaven, they will pray for you. Mary Magdalene died as she lived. Her last words, blessed be God forever. On the 8th of May, 1626, 19 years after she passed away, Pope Urban IV proclaimed her blessed. And on the 22nd of April, 1669, Clement IX, raised her to the glory of the saints. Blessed be God forever.